Yeah, you can go ahead and hit the top. Hit it. Cause you, hey, what's up, y'all? Hey, we, <laughs> hey. Get some people time to come on. Yeah, hey, hey, we, we just hey, welcome guys. Hey, we 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 just having a moment here and everything. Hey, welcome to uh critical dialogue. Hey, we thank y'all so much for allowing us to be a part of your viewership or yes. whether it's live or, or or the replay, either one. All right, hey, we want to thank you all so much. We got a great show lined up for you today. Um, I know it's spring break for some folks, just like for us, and so uh hey, hey, yeah, hey, thank I'm God relax, I'm to get up early. Yeah, man. Hey, definitely. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, hey, again, well, we are here and um, we are committed and we thank you all so much for joining us to things. How's your week been going, bro? Man, it's been a week, man. But hey, thank God for mm -hmm. it. You know, we had some some sunny, bright days and we had some days that's kind of gloomy. But, uh -huh. I remember, I, you know, one thing, too, about them old saints that I want to shout out. Them mm -hmm. old saints, the way when they sung them hymns, they had a way you could tell they were singing. Not only it was authentic, they were singing from the heart and from the experience. And if you go back to some of them old hymns mm -hmm. and listen to the words, them things mean something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like the principle of you know when I you know, but when my good days outweigh my bad days, I won't complain. You know, stuff like that. It's just like, bro, there was a there mm -hmm. was a, there was a richness there that we overlook. You know. I know now we all things new, but listen, the old need to new, just like the new needs to old. So, yes, sir, okay. yes, sir, definitely. Hey, Chris White, what's going on, bro? How you? Hey, feeling? how y'all doing? How y'all doing, man? Uh, that ain't <laughs> hey, him, man. is it? Hey, back man, on. back again. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, this is yeah. a good topic, man. <laughs> good topic, indeed, good topic. indeed. I told Ron, I said, yeah, we was excited to talk about this one, man. It's good to see you, bro. What's been going on hey, with you this week? Hey. Hey man, just 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 busy talking junk to all the Duke fans. Nah, I know, right? Long. Hey, you know what I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, I see yeah. that, man. Yeah. Hey, I see that. Yeah, yeah I just be just be just be having that fun. That was funny man. too. But, but uh, but but hey, man. But NC State got our uh, team, hey, uh, girls and boys in in the final four, man. So that's good for the area, man. That's yes, good for the area. but Definitely. I'm a, I'm a Tar Heel fan. But yeah, man. But uh, Same but here. great great topic, man. And um. Uh, and I had, you know, saying had to, you know, say ask myself, you know, the question and had to dig in the scripture a little bit. I'm like, hold on. Like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, because um, yeah, you know, that's, hey, that's the go to. That's the purpose of why we do what we do. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> had to have people dig and, and, and look at scripture again. Uh, hey, there, Sister Ashley, how you doing? Hey, and everyone else. So thank you all for so much for tuning in. And that's thanks, my wife, hey. y'all. For, for those y'all that didn't know. And my, my stomach is full coming from work because. <laughs> she she did a, a banging shrimp and grits for me. Oh man, hey, that's my favorite right there. Okay, yeah, hey. nah, that, yeah, that thing they, hey. it was good. So, shrimp and grits. Uh, all right, well, I'm talk that's on one of her one, one of her top list too. We got a I got a little top list of things she do real well. Okay. I'm about to put that on. Hey, salt, yeah. salt on those grits, salt and pepper. No, no, nah, no I ain't put no salt on there. No, 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 definitely no sugar. No, nah. and I didn't put sugar in it, but Chris, you. I mean, we yeah. supposed to be. I, I feel we have kinder spirit. You know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> you, but you start. I'm not, don't. I don't want to. I'm not gonna put you on the backslider. But it seems like you started to go the other way. <laughs> you said, sugar no, 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 no sugar. No I sugar on grits, baby. No I sugar don't go on no sugar grits. without sugar now. But what I was bought yeah. up on it was the gospel yeah. truth that sugar went in them. But anyway, no sir, uh, no. Well, that's I, a lie from I, the I, devil. No. I, 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 I never tried yeah. it because I came from a Christian household. <laughs> <laughs> Me either, Chris. Uh, hey, no, sugar uh, don't go on grits. No, uh -uh. Oh, just, some, man. just eggs and butter. Yeah, hey, that's what's up. <laughs> hey, yo, we want to thank you all again for allowing us to be a part of your night. All right. You all help make it what it is. You help make the show. So just like Chris. So if you want to come on, feel free. All right. You don't, you don't have to stay on long or in, in any comments, whatever. Hey, feel free. This is why we are here. All right. And so we, yeah, we want to thank you all so much. And we're going to keep we, we're going we're gonna to keep it rolling because hey, we know your night is definitely important. And um, again, we just uh, thank you for allowing us to be a part of it, because one thing you can't get back is what I teach the students is time. Time is one thing you can't get back. All right. But you definitely need to take time to um, um, to um, check out this book right here, The New Age of Vernacular. All, all right. <laughs> yes. And 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 Kiara. She's a mother oh, of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I you want to say that. prayer, Kiara. Yeah, that's, <laughs> hey. hey, that's why. That's why she's not to see your name. She's a mother of the Holy Ghost. But anyway, no. <laughs> y'all, yeah, those of y'all who haven't heard, please get the New Age vernacular exposing the world of language that Christians use. It ain't too many topics that we can talk about nowadays. In some way, form, or fashion, 
uh, in the area of I touch on it in the book from some way, form or fashion, as far as, you know, dealing with new age Christianity versus true Christianity. Also dealing with the schemes of the times and the culture that's coming in and because it's normalized, calling itself Christian when it and, and you know, we got to understand, guys, American Christianity is different from biblical Christianity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll preach the same thing. They sound the same at times, but ultimately they are different. But anyway, get my book, The New Age Vernacular, and it kind of dive into separating the American Christianity or cultural Christianity from the biblical one. So that's one of the things my book is about, just exposing the worldly language that Christians use intentionally and unintentionally. Some of us don't know that we're using them. You know what I'm saying? And there's a grace for that, or we don't know, understand why, but get the book to really be enlightened on why. And also, which by next week, Lord willing, I'm going to have a, a, a graphic to go with it. But if you're in the northeastern North Carolina, southeastern Virginia area, this month on the 21st, Sunday the 21st at 2 p.m., I'm going to be bringing our Sunday gatherings that we have been holding over a span now of about 10 years here in Greensboro. All right. We're going to take that to northeastern North Carolina. So uh, you all within driving this is that and you want to know some of the stuff about what I say, Listen, you don't know until you've actually been in there and experienced it because it really is. You ask anybody that's been, it's hard to describe, but we're going to host one right there in Gatesville, North Carolina on the 21st. Uh, you go on my page, you got the link is already there. We're not charging anything and we're feeding everybody. Well, yeah. so all you, but you do have to reserve your seat to make sure that we have everything properly in place. Yeah. Hey. And we got the hey, Jackson. Man. I don't want to say the Jackson Five, <laughs> but I'm just saying. When the Jacksons told me they was in, I said, "Man, we got some spiritual contingency coming." So that just made my smile that much more brighter and that much more anticipating. Because here's the thing I want to say real quick, y'all, before we get into it, is this: and one of the things that's missing in church is we don't realize that the body ministers to itself, mm -hmm. but we treat churches only as if the head can minister and everybody else is eligible. No, we can't do that because. That's what makes the church render paralyzed. Because just like a paralyzed body, the only thing to function is the head. But the body is limp. So I'm asking pastors and leaders, I'm trying to encourage them, listen, you will see some things if you afford the body itself, the pusid itself, to be empowered, to add to the spiritual well-being of the service, not just cut the grass. <laughs> or, or not just say you clean the bathrooms and say that is your godly work. No, everybody that comes to your church has a spiritual gift or gifts that they need to operate in when the saints come together. Lord knows I don't know what we're talking about, but that's that what's man, man say not just cutting the grass. <laughs> yeah, because you know, we got a lot of preachers that be like, Well, your you, you my spiritual gifts, if you ain't singing and preaching, we don't need your spiritual gift in here. You just you just do that out there when you're working on your job. First of all, it's not Bible. Mm. And we're gonna we're gonna discuss that when we do this. So I'm gonna do that whole little teaching mm -hmm. before we get into it. But I'm excited because because when you let the Holy Spirit do it, it's unpredictable. And every yes. one of our gatherings, they take on another meaning by themselves. So, but anyway, y'all be um, April the 21st at 2 p.m. Stay tuned to my page. It's already on there. The link where you can reserve. But I'm gonna bring out a graphic later on. So y'all stay tuned. Yeah, it seems like you're kind of getting started already. So <laughs> right, <laughs> give, it, give us a, a preview of it. <laughs> man, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, that's going to be awesome. Hey, how you doing? This is the Deborah, brother, brother Bernard. Hey, Will, Shout what's out, going on? Yeah. How you doing? He says, God designed the natural body to heal itself. It's the same for the body of Christ. Hey, yeah, hey, see what Stokes doing? Because yeah, I would yeah. ask the question, could it be that we ain't experienced all the healing that we want because we're looking at it from one person? Oh, mm. man, I'm just that's a good question. question. I mean, that's I'm a just very question. intriguing question. Yes. <laughs> and that's why we want you all to join in on this as well as we dive into it. All right. Hey, we are talking about is the Great Commission church invitation is 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 what Jesus said. Go ye therefore out there, compel them, preach to all nations, baptize them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And and then bring them to church too. And I, well, yeah, I just added that in there. But uh, is, <laughs> is that what the Great Commission is? Is getting bringing folks to church? Tell them, hey, come visit my church next Sunday or this Sunday, whatever. Or come visit my Bible study. Or as or is evangelizing is is that getting them inside the the church walls? Is that the the true nature of evangelism? Just a question. Is that part of the Great Commission? Hey, you you come with your comments, yay, nay, whatever. So hey. 
Oh, okay. Hey, again, let's have a dialogue. Okay. All right. For, <laughs> hey, Brother, Brother Lee, Lee. Okay. First Corinthians yeah, he 14. Bible, he, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what I talk about is that's exactly the chapter that I'm going to be teaching from on the 21st. Yeah. So Lee, hope you can be there. I think you're in the Hampton Roads area, man. Come down and fellowship yeah. with the people. But anyway. Man, okay. Well, then, hey, again, answer this question. Is the Great Commission church invitation? All right. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I can go ahead and start saying that's how we were pretty much taught 95% of of our, all our church lives. Well, I can speak speak for myself, but it was just that, yeah, we always say, hey, you want to get people to come to church with you, man. You, you know, man, you know, invite that unsaved brother or sister to church and all because, again, this is a form of witnessing. You know what I'm saying? And once they hear the word of God, it's so man, it's going to touch their hearts or whatever and things like that. Um, but yeah, um, that's what I remember being taught. Uh, Will says, did he say go out and preach the gospel or did he tell them to come in so they can hear the gospel? Hey, what does the text say? It's the first laws, first rules and the laws of hermeneutics. Uh, what does the text say? Okay. And it says, yeah, go, go out there and preach to all nations, preach the gospel. I guess it goes to your point, Crawley, about uh, us being more of an uh, of a firefighter, as uh, uh, you know, mo you know that mobile ministry going out there, and so yes, that mobile yes. physician. He said, uh, "Okay, all right, all right yeah, he's telling yeah, me to be in the DC area. All right, but uh, but yeah, all right, hey, let's start with there. Did he say go out and preach the gospel, or did he tell them to come in so they can hear the gospel? Right, again, when you well." What does the word commission mean? Okay, let's 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 start there. All right. Yeah, well, anybody can jump in. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, uh, well, when you asked what the commission mean, commission basically mean you you've been authorized to do something. <clears throat> you mm -hmm. know, um, just like anybody in the military. You know, saying you got like <clears throat> commissioned officers and non commissioned officers. That means you have a several a, a certain level of authority. And with the Great Commission, Jesus was telling uh, the disciples that they have, have the authority to go out and, you know, saying and, and teach people, you know, saying like the way that they were taught. But mm -hmm. um, the thing that I'm really kind of I, I don't want to say wrestling with with this is um, I know for at face value, it seemed like telling people to come to church is not the Great Commission. But but I'm kind of leaning towards is it may be a part of it. Because because he, he told us to go, but he also said to uh, he said uh, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he also uh, told us to make disciples. Yeah. And 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 when people come to church and sit up under the fivefold ministry gift, I do believe that that could be considered a part of you know discipleship, mm -hmm. but not but not like leaning on that solely as you know what I'm saying and mm -hmm. and I'm sure you know what I'm saying Crawley has more insight on it um that he could give but I but it, but that's just what I was thinking about like like could that be considered a part of well, it because you, you we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there is some benefit right. from people coming to church but hey we, William said William says for clarity is good to invite but we also need to equip the believers to go out and win souls because the Bible say he who wins the souls is wise. You know Amen. So, Amen. Um, That's in the book. That's in the book. Yeah, and you know, and one of the things, too, that from the all-star, too, this is why I'm glad also not only that Chris decided to join us tonight so it could be more of a conversation because, mm -hmm. and, and I made a post earlier about I am going to be, if for those of y'all who didn't see it, I'm going to be challenging us to have a mindset and an execution shift. Yeah. One reason is because it needs to be if we really take an honest assessment of what is and what isn't happening to people who go to church and have been going often. But uh, but with that said, we're not looking, my bar and my burden, which is not everybody's, it's not every leader. It is, I love the church. And because of my love for the church, I expect more out of it. And so mm -hmm. that creates for me personally, a heaviness. And, it, and it, of course it's tied to what my calling is, but it produces a heaviness in me whenever I see things that have crept in and become normal, but those things <clears throat> that have become normalized literally hinder what's mm. in the text. That's a good point. Okay. So, and prime example, Chris White just said something, which I agree with what he was saying, but notice what he said, even when he went back to the text and what did he just say? It did say to go and make disciples. So mm -hmm. when I just take that thing at face value, 
Let's ask the question, okay, well, first of all, if the text tells us to go and make disciples, could could it, is it also safe to say that if we have now become accustomed to practices that's standing in the way of discipleship making, shouldn't we challenge that? Hmm. Even if the thing ain't direct sin, it just might be a custom, a customary tradition that we hold dear, but in holding on to that tradition, if we're not getting fresh wind of true, authentic discipleship. Mm. And so and so my mindset here is not I'm when I'm pointing the thing, I'm not talking about anybody, but just almost everybody, because I do know church this is a demo. and I know what 90 percent of what people call church is. It is we come to 90 percent of church is Sunday morning is the main part of ministry. And mm-hmm. in the main part of ministry, look what it entails. The main part of that ministry is a sermon. You come in and get a couple of songs. I call it the two, two, one, two songs, <laughs> two offerings and one sermon. And I know everybody kind of deviates from that, but the formula is pretty much the same. You come and hear a preached word by one set man every Sunday, but ask yourself the question, and then we get to inviting people to come to this. Is it and has it been great for true disciple making? Hmm, okay. Here's to go. So I'm not pointing the finger, but I just want to point some things out mm-hmm. about why we need because we're not just shooting off the cuff. We're not getting mm-hmm. bored because stuff is old. We're just saying, can it be more effective? Why? Why not? Now, common sense says, what did ask? What did the church do in the first century? All right. Mm-hmm. Hey, we can't ignore the historical value for sure. Mm-hmm. Thank you, there, common sense. Hey, let's 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 think on this. I like right. one reason why not only I like that question, but I like let's just look at the church. Period. Because here's one thing I do know about the way that we do church. It don't have as much pedigree as we like to believe, but mm-hmm. it does feel old to us because a lot of our forefathers have dived into it. So when you look at church in every stage and then ask yourself, when you take all of the time and all of the church together, along with the way we do it now, ask yourself, are there varying experiences of what people have called church? I'm talking about the true church that is, mm-hmm. but was all those experiences resembling what we see on the average Sunday morning? That's just nah, a uh-uh. question that kind of get us to actually think. And we, see, no. <laughs> yeah, we see biblical church because one thing too, that I caution a lot of, a lot of dignitaries who are real versed and well studied. And they went to the theological seminary. One of the things that I've seen about those people, and I'm just generalizing, not saying everybody is that sometimes the smart people have a hard time differentiating between biblical church and historical church. And sometimes we give historical church too much validity, if you will, mm-hmm. if it's not represented in scripture. And so that's just something that we, and I challenge when I'm, you know, I just submit that to people just to get them thinking, because there are some church practices that were good. There were some that were bad, but whether it's good or bad, we can't treat church practices as if they are the gospel because there was no perfect church, no matter of, you know, what time frame. And not only that, we don't want to become like the Catholic church because one of the things, one of the things about the Catholic church is they deem their traditional church practices just as important. They'd be like, even if the Bible don't say it, but the church does it, Traditionally, that is still valid, simply based off the pedigree of what the church have been doing for so long. Well, I know we're copying what the um, um, uh, the the Council of Nicaea, or so historically, with what they uh, have implemented. And again, again, that was hundreds of years ago. And so, the, you know, the way that we do church now, you know, it, again, it starts from you know the Catholic Church, and so it's like, all right, you know. Who's going to really challenge that, or, or are we really going to change if, if we find out what is how the true way that we're supposed to be, um, um, um doing church, if, if if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, even though we are the church or so forth, when it comes to assembling ourselves right. together, but again, yeah, as common sense says, you know, what did the first century church do back then? And so, uh, and 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 then not only that, here's one thing we want to talk about too for everybody's listening, and I know. Listen, I have learned, I've been in this for a long time. This isn't just a subject that I just picked up last week. I've literally been working, you know, on this for about a decade and a half, about 15 years for this very subject. And so 
with that, I, I've come to understand that, look, I'm not wasting my time with the people who want to romance the old wineskin. Mm -hmm. Because there are people, there are preachers, there are leaders, there are people who've been in church all their life. Mm -hmm. God himself can't come down and tell them to change the way that they do church. So why, why should I bother? <laughs> but I'm right. only for the people who are in it, but still love God enough to be willing to not be fearful of change, especially when we can see some biblical pedigree, especially when, when we read the Bible and we see what we do on Sunday morning, there seems to be a little gap of experiential difference that nobody wants to talk about in length or even discuss. Why? Because that creates a dissonance because no one wants to hear the thing that you have loved and been believing in for so long isn't as effective as you like to believe. So I get it. Mm. I do have patience with anybody that want to know, but guess what? I also understand it is possible for folks who use who love the old wine skin to change because you know what? I'm one of those people. I'm an embodiment mm -hmm. of that. I love the old church. I was brought up the old way in the old church. Some good, some not so good. But so I'm not just throwing it all away, but I'm not also just holding on for the sake of the traditional romance either. And it has been time to change. Why? Because of what the times are, the times that are coming, if we don't change, a lot of people will lose their quote unquote religion. Because they, when they lose their church building or their pastor, because it's going to be outlawed to preach sound doctrine. It ain't may not be tomorrow, mm -hmm. but when it happens, uh -huh. when Christian persecution hit, how will we function? How will our ecclesiology function? Well, I think, too, part of it is that people get, you know, we're comfortable. We don't like change. We like the we like the routine of what we're doing. And especially when it comes to to the church or Christianity. If it's not a heaven or hell issue, then it's like, OK, well, I don't really want to change. I want to keep doing it this way. And, yeah. and the fact the battery is wrong. You know what? This mm -hmm. is indirectly has the potential to be a heaven or hell issue for people. Really? This is why it's important enough to talk about what we're talking about. The great because when we talk about what's on the flyer, right, we talk about the Great Commission. The mm -hmm. Great Commission is to go out and get people saved. And if we don't do that, folks won't get saved. God is using his church. Mm -hmm to go out and get people saved and disciple. But if we don't do it, that could be a heaven and hell issue for somebody. So basically if we don't get it, uh, if we continue this way for as inviting them to church or so, if, if we continue on with that, then folks really won't get the gospel per, per se. Let me say this. Let's, let's back up for a moment and talk about this. Let's ask ourselves the question, church people, let's ask ourselves this. What has Easter just passed, right? You know, Easter, or if you call it Resurrection Sunday, whatever we want to call it. But we all know that's the biggest, quote unquote, evangelistic uh, day mm -hmm. of the church. This is the day where right. they can fill up their church with sinners in hopes that the pastor will preach a message that will convict people and get them to the altar, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> so my question is this. What has inviting people to church, and not only that, let's, ask, let's take an assessment. We all would we not all agree that when you look at just generally speaking, church at large sees evangelism as you going out there and inviting somebody to come in here by Sunday. Yeah. Could we all agree that if we be honest, yeah. most churches feel that, man, in order for the church to grow, we got to invite, invite, invite. One of the biggest places right. when you get a church, got to invite people, you got to invite sinners and then not only that. What does that ultimately end up turning into? Which we're going to have a video in a minute about what a lot of people have been talking about this last week with the Stephen Furtick's church and the lady that talked about that. We're going to bring this video up because mm -hmm. what is happening is if you are so in love with evangelism, which is nothing wrong with, but if you're so in love with it that you would allow evangelism to take over yes, church Jackson. on Sunday, and if church on Sunday is looked at as the main part of ministry, my question to you would be, how is, how are we not starving discipleship and disciple making? I don't think we really understand what discipleship is. This is true. <laughs> I mean, you think I about we, with that. you know, I mean, we hear the word, but we haven't really have an in-depth teaching on how do you make a disciple? What is discipleship? So. Yeah, and that's this, part of the issue. And what uh -huh. this is caused is, and see, and this is why I love talking to leaders. I'm a leader's leader because it makes us do some spiritual spring cleaning to go back to our first love or to what God called us to first. Because if we be honest now, and we're going to see a good example of this in this video that I'm going to bring up, 
the leaders and the church people, period, have fallen more in love with growing the church than mm. they have developing the people that come. And like Sister Jackson said, the activity of the church is like joining a sorority or a fraternity. And yeah, <laughs> I've seen it, that. It, it can be, and it can be for a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but before I go on into further, is there any, anything anybody else want to say or any response? Man, Chris, what you got, brother? Yeah, I, um, a lot of things, man. But um, <clears throat> first thing, hey, man. I have a question. Uh, I said, um, what are we doing as when it comes to discipleship besides? Uh, telling people to go to church. Just, I guess, kind of asking that as a question, Good you know, question. Because, because I know that there are some some people who are doing it, quote unquote, right, and some people not. There may be some people out there that's listening, and they may be doing some good, good things that other people just don't know about. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is, it's just a thought I want to share. It's like, this is this is just scary. You know what I'm saying? When I say it's scary, because if if most people, let's say if it's 90 percent. And that's all they're doing. Like they're doing zero percent of anything other than just inviting people to church. And and then with the, the thing that you brought up before, like there's going to come a day when, um, you know, what I'm saying it's illegal to preach sound doctrine and so on and so forth. Like like what if that happened? Like 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 COVID hit. Like like where would we be? Um, how, uh, how, how mm -hmm. are we going to survive as a church, as a people, and how many people are going to be lost because there's nothing in place? Just, just th those are just thoughts. That's a good point. Hey, I, I want to read these comments right here, though, that goes along with what you're saying. Uh, says, um, Katrina says, We think bringing them to church is bringing them to Jesus, and all it is, uh, is are a bunch of membership requirements <laughs> yeah exactly not exactly how to be the church yeah, most most definitely come on, most come definitely on. <laughs> and then uh sister deborah says i believe we've been doing it wrong in that we're to assemble to strengthen each other the body and then go out and disciple iron sharpening iron i believe the enemy is so prevalent in the body because we've invited the enemy to join us <laughs> oh, wow <laughs> Well, <laughs> the common sense says, ask, we got to go back to that. Yeah, we got to go to that. Common sense asks, are there examples of evangelism happening in the church, in the body, or, or the examples from outside the church? Yeah, we want to see some examples. Common sense, I love what you're bringing because that's what we wanted to get to in the second part of this because mm -hmm. we want to go to the Bible to see did Jesus evangelize the way we are attempting to today? There you go. Did his disciples evangelize the way that we are attempting to today? There, is there something else that we read in scripture? And so, but you know, so so with that said, let me start off by saying this, you guys. And I've said this before. The evangelistic church, the way we're doing it now, is killing the disciple making church. That's good. I want y'all to take time to really because this is I'm getting into some stuff. I'm, trying to get us to transition in our minds to go other places that it hadn't been before. So just stick with me. The evangelistic church, the way that we are doing it, is killing the disciple-making church. And I'm going to explain, but I just want that to really, I want that to kind of marinate there for Maybe a second. Not. One reason is, so let me, and let me say this example. Here's one thing to kind of go along with what I just said. Do we not realize that the bathroom is just as important as the kitchen. <laughs> yep. The bathroom in your house is just as important as the kitchen in your house. Think about it. What happens in the kitchen? You feed people. The kitchen is designed to prepare food for intake into your body. What is the bathroom for? It is designed to have a release for whatever you feed and put into the body. You follow me? So mm -hmm. get this. If you have no if you have no outlet and all you have is inlet, even if all you eat is perfectly healthy stuff, you will soon die. Yeah. So yep. look, oh hear me. Intake is just as important as outgoing, right? Yeah. The bathroom is just as important as the kitchen. But let me ask you a question. Could we fathom? Could you ever fathom a house yeah, or, right. or, or, or building plans or going to someone's house or designing a house where the bathroom and the kitchen is in the same room? Mm. 
Uh, <laughs> Hey, this is critical dialogue right here. <laughs> we having a critical dialogue. What are your comments on this? All right. Yes. Oh, man. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I got to take it like this to go slow because we trading into man. trying to get people to change. When you're trying to deal with man. innermost parts and getting people to change things and they've always looked, you got to kind of take it slow like this. So this is the reason why I'm doing mm -hmm. this. But just think about that for a moment, because here's the thing. Both are important. Evangelism and discipleship are both important. We're not putting one over the other. They are both needed and necessary for the church to not only be replenished, but to go on being the salt of the earth. But I just want to let that example marinate. We got some responses to that example. You know, yeah. love to hear Chris White's, you know, response to that. What do you think about just the example and stuff like that? Does it make sense? And then I know we got some other. And let's go to our comment section. The uh, comment section says, I want to say this respectfully. It seems that evangelizing only in church seems to build church members, but evangelizing outside of the church would build independent. And, Who is um, this guy? Because has he been seeing my notes? I must have, I guess. Hey, he must be in tune oh, to the spirit or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he or she, whoever, is definitely on it. And uh, Bernard says building a church name has become more important than building the kingdom. Yes, it has. Oh, yes, boy. it has, definitely. And uh, 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 Dr. Wheatley says the church in the West almost is in apostate position and only a remnant in the West will be. Uh, so I can't seem to pull it up a little bit, but hey, wow. <laughs> hey, this, hey, yeah. hey, Ron, can you bring up that, that comment that uh, the brother made again? Um, gosh. Bernard, no, common yeah. sense. Oh, uh -huh. Hold on. No, 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 no. no. Um, so no, it was, hold on. Yeah, that's one right here. Yeah. So I'm expecting. Uh huh. But if you're outside the church. Yeah, okay. That's something I was thinking about earlier today. Uh uh that's kind of in that vein. Um it, it, it's it's in uh so it's like if if you and I know and I Crawley, I get what you're saying, the whole bathroom kitchen thing, it seemed like there ain't no way that, that, that that's supposed <laughs> to be like that. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're eating that food now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um but but then but then um it's like as as we transition to i guess doing it the the biblical way um people have to be trained in that as well and i think that's where discipleship comes in because because there is a a, a thin line to where people can be out here doing stuff and they doing stuff too independently like like kind of just you know building their own you know saying church so to speak or or and, and i don't mean mm -hmm. like building their own followers. I'm just saying there's a lot of times people could be doing some some wild stuff that's out of order and call it discipleship. And mm -hmm. and so uh it is it, I mean this question is just really showing up a lot of the the um the shortcomings and flaws uh and 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 the lack of um having proper methods in place you know um it, it is is what I see and mm -hmm. um and and this is critical dialogue not like we have all the answers i'm like some of the stuff i'm just thinking out loud because um this is this is some heavy stuff yeah hey is, again that's why we're having this dialogue for, you, for us to think and all again you know you you know ask the lord to give you some discernment here as well yeah. you know what I'm saying what's i mean because we're all here to learn you know and, and these are some valid questions and you don't get this kind of conversation you know in a regular church service or or pretty much less anywhere. Not saying it's not being done, but again, we're here on a live forum here. So, again, what you know, what are what are your thoughts on this? Is the Great Commission, or is it is it all about church invitation? Because this yeah, is what so, we have been taught. Go ahead. So let's talk about what the let's just talk about what normally we look at as strong evangelism is doing to discipleship making. Okay, yes, think yes. about think about think about what this does. When you tell people get tunnel vision on making sure you bring two or three guests with you back to church, and in hopes that they're going to hear a good sermon or a good nugget in the sermon, and then they're going to run to the altar to get saved. Do you know what that does? What that does is that first of all, make the people who are supposed to be adults by now over reliant on the preacher's ability. To bring someone to Christ. 
Because yeah. here's the thing about let's just ask first of all, okay, what is the what is the what is the the um the goal of discipleship? Discipleship is here to make other people to become of spiritual or even natural age. So the, you there is no need for discipleship if you don't have a need for the people who are babies to grow up and no longer be babies. So hmm. what happens is when we put people up and we say, hey, man, y'all invite people to church, invite people to the church. That may be fine in the beginning because you tell babies, babies can't feed babies. You might not. If you just got saved last week, you might not understand how to lead someone to, to the Lord. But what is that doing to the adults who are still inviting people and believing more in the church that they try to get them to on a Sunday? They believe more in that church than the church that is right here while you're in the presence of a sinner. Hmm. Hmm. See, because the biblical way is you don't have to wait to Sunday. Yeah. What if someone die and we're gonna preach that tomorrow ain't promised and you on Monday and you fresh out of church on Monday and it's Monday, they got six days to die <laughs> before they get salvation. So so and here's what I'm saying. Yeah, of course this, nobody yeah. would say, of course nobody would say that verbally, but our actions in church shows us that. I haven't matured. If I just keep getting them to come to the church and I do it, that lessens my sense of urgency as a leader to grow them up to do it themselves. Ah. Hmm. And wow. if we just look, take a real life assessment at church, the average church goer who have been going for a long period of time is underdeveloped Develop. spiritually. Meaning the years that they have been going to church and have been claiming to walk with Christ does not line up with their spiritual maturity level. Why hmm. is it that you still been a deacon in the church for 10 to 15 years and you can't hold us, you can't hold a spiritual note, you can't handle that word by now? It should be the norm for the folks who have been coming, but you know what? They don't have to if all they got to do is rely on the head, the pastor, the doctor to do everything. Now, uh, yeah, like some of these comments here, since Deborah says people are, that's why we have to have try the spirit by the spirit. And the scripture says, and Katrina says, church hosts a bunch of programs and put on a lot of theater, theater to entice the world to come. And that's why they feel they have to, um, because we're supposed to go make disciples, not advance a membership based program. That's pretty much what it is. <laughs> now, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Willie says there, there cannot be discipleship without biblical orthodoxy. The stuff being preached over the most pulpit is humanism with Christian jargon. <laughs> Yeah, that's that true. is that's, that, that that's, is so that's, true. That's happening a lot, not everywhere, that, but it's definitely happening too much. More than right. Shit. William says this doesn't fit fully, but I saw the church illustration like Benjamin Button. When discipleship is missing, people actually become less mature over time. That, man, that's again. We have to understand what does discipleship look like. Okay, and how, anything that we're doing standing in the way of it. But yeah, go ahead. Right. Mark. Anything we're hey. doing standing in the way of. It. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I just want to say, like, um, I remember I was a, a part of a, a church at one point in time, and um, man, I was on fire, man. I, I was uh, bringing people to church, man. I, I got a couple of trophies, man, where I got like the soul winner award, <laughs> bringing, so many, <laughs> bringing so many people to church. But but the thing about it was <laughs> that I would say is that um, if I was if I would lead somebody to Christ, I was sticking with them and 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 disciple them myself. Like I was spending time with them outside of church. And and that's what right. should be happening. Fellowship. But but I also know that um what I was doing, everybody else wasn't doing. You know what I'm saying? Not to try to make myself seem special, but and, and and it even got to a point to where um I was bringing people in and Honestly, the people were being run out because of the way church was being done. Mm -hmm. And 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 it got to a point like I love God. I, I, I love, you know, saying seeing people get saved so much that I I would win people to Christ and I would send them to another church, you know, um, mm. because because of, you know, some of the wow. the harmful things that that was uh, that was taking place because because I'm still I still have a commission to make disciples. You know what I'm saying, and and when and, right. and the word disciple basically means um, become a student of Christ. You know, you you um, 
You, you know what I'm saying? We're we're disciples. That don't mean we got all the answers. That just means that we're a student and, and we want to make more students and, and point them like, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't just follow me. But right. um, so so um, so, yeah, like like this, this topic is uh, this this is this is crazy, man, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's just a it's just a lot to unpack. And and that's why we're here to, you know, I'm saying to to grow and to think and have these quote unquote hard conversations and then next ask the question all right what are we willing to do to change this okay yeah. because and, and, especially and, one of the things oh yeah go ahead Chris go ahead no I was just gonna say when you ask that question what do we do to change it sometimes people aren't in a position to change it because you can have somebody like like I was in a body and it was a lot of things that was good but it was a lot of things that that wasn't good but I, I'm I'm the type of person I consider myself a leader and if something is against the Bible, I'll challenge it. But but then when you challenge things that's not biblical and you're a member of a body, a lot of times the people that's in that body, they just group think. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the mm -hmm. pastor could be doing something wrong according to the Bible. That's but true. if if you have 20 or 50 or 100 people in the church, you'd be like, oh, well, yes, I'm going to just do what the pastor <laughs> say because he the pastor. And I'm like, no, nah, but the Bible <laughs> said... And, and and they don't want to flow with the Bible. They want to flow with the pastor, well, even if he's out of order. Well part, well, part of that reason, Chris, is that it's been taught if you go against the man of man of God or whatever, then you're being rebellious and all because he's a sent man and he sent you and you were sent to um, support that ministry. So it's like, yeah, but what? But what if you're going against God? <laughs> well, hey, Crawley can tell you that because you know, that's true. That's true. you know what I'm saying? Like, like and that's hey. an indication of because here's think about it in not your life, right, idolatry. Yes, we were all kids who are now adults, and think about this mm -hmm. when it comes to your your natural leaders, your parents. The older that you became, the more you started seeing their flaws and understanding that my parents were ain't perfect, but in right. the beginning, as a child, you thought they were. Right. So maturity also brings you to the place that where you can discern the flaws of your leaders. Now, now I'm not saying don't handle that respectfully because we all should. You see what I'm saying? But what I am saying is that that's a part of what Chris White, when we that picture that he painted, a lot of people are so tunnel vision towards always following whatever the pastor says because they're not mature enough and have the fortitude enough to be like, well, hey, I know hey, God's word and I'm Bless picking you. up on the fact that pastor that ain't right. But like he said, I like when he said that we're group think because that is very, very prevalent and in more ways than it should be. And I talk about in my seminars, I talk about the difference between healthy loyalty and unhealthy loyalty. Mm. Loyalty is needed. We know as Americans, we don't an American church don't have as much loyalty as we need. But beware of unhealthy loyalty. And there is a huge difference. But there it is. I, I want to say that that picture that you painted, uh, Chris, and uh, uh, yeah, Crawley has gone through that. And so, all right, again, with the leader, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but the word of God says this, you know, and so, yeah, you're going to get a conflict from that. All right. Um, uh, Sydney says, have you all heard the new woke thing among young Christians that is causing them to fall because they have not been trained as disciples? Deconstruction of Christianity. Um, yeah, we heard that. We heard that. Kind of yeah, that. okay. All right. Um, then politically speaking, the church was more interested in the government handout rather than taking resp responsibility for the widows, orphans, and then tax you the, the tithe and tell you to believe God will, while the church gets top heavy financially on the pulpit, and then the church tells them they don't have enough faith in of these. Yeah, that's that prosperity message. So, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank y'all so much for your comments too. Thank you so much. To to also to 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 move on, I want to bring this into perspective as we go mm -hmm. to the next leg here. And it is look again. Look at we're not just picking this out to point the finger because we know ain't nobody perfect and we just bored, so we feel like looking at what someone is doing wrong. Because again, let me preface this by saying I truly do believe that there are a lot more that every pastor who's out there doing church ineffective, they don't want to. Mm -hmm. just here's one thing about church. You, when when a, when a leader starts a church and when he feels he's called to ministry, he never consult God as far, as far as how that ministry should execute. What he do, he leaves it up to what he's seen before. This is why every church looked like a carbon copy, especially denominationally. So I know, well, if I'm called a pastor, I got to get a building, got to get a band, got to get butts in the seats, got to collect offerings. And I got to, and the bigger audience that I have to preach to, that makes me feel like I'm a important and right effective there, pastor. You see what I'm saying? But that's not it. So let's talk about what 
this is doing to church when when because again I want to ask this question if church should be discipleship making according to Ephesians 4 then and if we say that Sunday morning most look at most leaders most Christians look at Sunday morning as the main part of ministry but if we make Sunday mornings evangelistic when is there time and place for the people to be discipled by their leader? Mm. Because now let me follow that question up with this reality. Because this is why a lot of people have a problem in the book that I wrote That's when right. I talk about, when I ask the question. So now this brings us back around because get this, if we really feel that Sunday mornings is designed to be evangelistic, then guess what? Church should be for everybody. Hmm. But what's problematic to the church and disciple making is that when you make church for everybody, meaning if you're a sinner or saint, we church should not be the place to turn people away. We've heard stuff like this all our lives, even though we don't have Bible for it. I would say Jesus is a place, is a person that don't turn a willing person away, that's willing to follow him. But church, I, I don't agree with. And so when we go down the road, we would look at churches, and I'm going to pull up a scripture too. We look at churches as, wow, they are wise because they are they have found a way to get the whole world to come to church on Sunday mornings. You want to know mm -hmm. how to end this discipleship? Because going back to what my statement was, the evangelistic church will kill the discipleship church if you bring both to try to do them at the same time. Go back to the bathroom and the kitchen. Go back to the bathroom in the kitchen. So here's the thing. Both of them are necessary. But let me ask y'all a question as we go on. And then the sidelines, let me, I'm going to ask y'all a question. When we look, look at Jesus in the Bible, there were a lot of notable stories that we all preach, we quote, we teach from, we've heard them all our lives. That were mm -hmm. evangelistic stories. And I would ask you all, can y'all type up some? Bring up some of Jesus' most notable instances of evangelism. <clears throat> all right. Um. I'm going to read these um, comments and then we'll go to Chris's question here. Uh, William says, uh, submission to a spiritual leader is not unconditional. Also, we shouldn't be obligated to someone that we can't approach if we have questions about what they're doing if you don't see it in scripture. I totally agree. That's more like witchcraft if, if you can't approach them enough. All right. Um, Common Sense says, yes, pastors should be respected, but people reinforce with the scripture calling people rebellious. Yes, as I said earlier, you don't go against God's anointed and throw in the curse from robbing God. And a lot of fear is taught. That's exactly. I, I totally agree. And uh, hey, shout out to those who are watching us on, 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 on my Twitter page. If you got any com questions or comments, feel free to join in. All right. Well, thank you all. All right, Chris. Hey, what's, what's your question? Hey, you're um, yeah, man, you're on mute. You're on mute. Okay, my question is, um, some people would say uh, we have evangelistic Sundays and we do discipleship on other days of the week. And so what would you say to that, uh, Pastor Crowley? Good question. What I would say to that is it really doesn't matter on what day or what time you do it on. Because when I go to leaders or when I assess churches or when I assess leadership to determine I'm not so much as caught up on the day or when it happens. I'm caught up on the balance of is it happening and happening enough. So if there's a church that would say, well, we only use Sunday mornings for evangelism, but I can see a track record of healthy discipleship making throughout the course of the week. Because if this is, now if this is true, then Sunday morning wouldn't be looked at as the main part of ministry. But most churches do. So I would definitely say, yeah, because, you know, just like the Bible says, we don't want to get caught up on the day. But what we're talking about is how we see Sunday mornings. But, yeah, I would tell a church that, look, if you evangelize on Sunday morning, if you use that as your tactic, but I can see how the leader is spending time developing and allowing people to pick his brain of those who he's called to disciple you know what I'm saying? Throughout the week or on another day or Sunday night or Sunday morning, you know, that's all fine and good. But what normally happens is the disease of what normally happens is it's out of balance. And discipleship normally ain't ain't happening very rarely because one of the things about discipleship that's different from evangelism is it takes another level of time. See, mm -hmm. you try to evangelize somebody through a sermon and, 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 and dust your hands off. When you're discipling someone, you're going to have to not only give them information, but you're going to have to, like the Bible says, what does the Bible say? 
In the Old Testament, he says, I will uproot you and give you leaders after my own heart that would do two things. What are those two things? Feed you with knowledge and understanding. In order to feed someone, but the church has only been satisfied with feeding people with knowledge, but little to no understanding. Because to understand the knowledge that you're given, you have to give have allowed them chance to unfold the knowledge that you submitted to them by allowing them to ask you questions about the knowledge you just gave. And normally, where do you go in church where there's an ample enough time and opportunity for you, just like the other preacher just said, to pick the brain of the one who calls you his disciple and you would call him your leader. So let me make sure I'm hearing you right. So the difference mm -hmm. in discipleship is that um, people are able to again ask questions have have a dialogue pick pick the preacher's brain and again they're teaching them how to um you know how to evangelize how to uh uh the uh what is it the uh i guess the the uh, foundation of what christianity is is, is all about or or the equipment so i just want i mean does that I make sense Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would rephrase that by saying this. The difference between, and if we start fundamentally, you remember, Ron, we did, and y'all go back and look at it. We did a series, I think, the last of the year, and we went through mostly all of the what we call the fivefold ministries. Right, yeah. The difference between each one of them. Because one right. of the issues is we have a lot of, one of the biggest issues when it comes to Christian leadership is misplacement. There's a lot of gifted people, but everybody that's gifted and we feel that can preach a sermon, we automatically ready to make them a pastor. Yeah. <laughs> and that caused a great deal of misplacement. It's not that you're not gifted. It's not that you're not called to lead, but you're not called to lead in that stead. So one of the things that's hurting church is there's a lot of evangelists at heart that are spirit. trying to be pastors. So what happens is what happens is this. So when we look at when we look at that, just just talk about the difference between evangelism and, and pastoral care and, it, and evangelism is invitational the reason why evangelism is there is that you want to go out and invite people who are not who are not saved an opportunity to receive christ to become christians that's what evangelism is that's different than what pastoral care is because pastoral care isn't inviting people who don't know jesus Mm -hmm. Pastoral care is developing those who already know him to take to nurture them until they go from spiritual immaturity to maturity. See the difference? So right, what is yes, happening man. is we have a lot of well-meaning. And remember, when I talk like this, I'm not pointing the finger saying that we got evil people. I'm talking about well-meaning people who are simply misplaced. Yes, you are supposed to only be tonal vision about reaching new souls. But if you do that and try to be a pastor, that's very dangerous because what's going to happen is your disciples who are looking to you to help grow them up will be malnourished because all you're doing is tunnel vision towards reaching the loss. Guess what? Pastoral care and evangelism. One is for the loss. One is for those who are already found. And get this, two Make different promises. types of food for two different types of people. So if you're giving people who are already found food for the loss, they are not growing up because they're getting these baby messages that's designed to convince people of their need for Christ. They already passed that stage. Right. So when you make Sunday morning evangelistic, because, and guess what? You're going to make it evangelistic because when you tell people to invite people and sinners come into your church, you're going to be accommodating to them in your theology, unfortunately, but then you're <laughs> going to look to try to reach them. Swag and that's so one of the biggest problems about why I say that the evangelistic church is killing the disciple making church. Because if all your pastor is doing is to reach the lost, reach, I got a heart for the lost. Okay, well, you shouldn't be a pastor. You should be an evangelist. And that's not a demotion. <laughs> that's not a demotion at all. We see it as that. And it's funny how we look at every leader as they pastors. But it's only mentioned the second least out of all of the fivefold ministry in all the scripture. But that's the one that we feel we know about the most. And it and it seems like um, if if there's misplacement there, uh, this may not always be the case, but it seems like they'll be more focused on the numbers than doing what's right. And and as a pastor or, or any kind of leader, at some point you got to correct folk, you know. So so uh, so uh, a lot of people, even in business, they won't challenge or correct people because they're afraid that it's going to affect their bottom line. And if and if you have a mindset, it seems there that you go, Chris. You 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 all about the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. <laughs> uh, some sometimes it's better that you know, what I'm saying 
be a, 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 a lean, mean fighting machine, then they have a whole bunch of, you know what I'm saying, people that, that should be connected to you. But this is just Man. my thought. Hey, and that's a good thought right there, man. I'm gonna read some of these comments here. But uh hey, if you are tuning in, so hey, feel free to comment. All right, all right. If you want to come on, so especially those watching us on other platforms, YouTube and Twitter, all right, feel free to uh, make a comment or a question or so. I, I would definitely see it. Uh man, uh sister Ashley says in Islam, there's a process of training before entering holy places amid to rid worldly distractions. Mm. Christianity invites all in, but this can lead to confusion, especially for newcomers or children. Perhaps we should prioritize evangelizing and discipling before entering the sanctuary. A very, very good point. Ooh. Definitely. <laughs> a very good point. Uh, com common sense says for most churches, I would say Sunday service is not effective for evangelism. It, it's like dropping fifth grader in a college calculus class. A sinner needs more intimate interaction for evangelism. <laughs> well, y'all dropping these names, man. Intimate interaction. Intimate. That's age. what Jesus gave in these intimate. stories. Like y'all look at the, just look at the Bible. Look at Jesus. I'm, I'm a firm believer that if he's Lord and if we say he was God in flesh and the Bible that walked among us, why don't we just pay attention to what he did? So look at look at this look at the stories, y'all. Can so mm -hmm. I wanted some people to give me an answer to what are some of the evangelistic stories that we're most notable that's Jesus' most notable stories. So what right. comes to mind? What comes to mind real quick? Uh the prodigal son. Okay, you say prodigal son that won't Jesus won't in that story, but that was oh that was oh, oh no oh. um Zacchaeus. Yeah. Okay, Zacchaeus. Yeah. Zacchaeus. Yeah. Zacchaeus. What about the women? The women with the issue of blood. The women with the issue of blood. The women at the well. Women caught in the act of adultery. Yeah. Look at all of those stories and then ask yourself, where were they? Where did they take place? Outside. How of many church. of them took place inside of the temple? I don't think one did. How many? I mean, just I'm just like when we think about yeah, Jesus feeding the multitude. Yeah. We uh, we we see where Jesus preached in the temple a lot. But the most uh, notable story is where he reached out to people uh, to the, get saved and converted. Uh, the guy that got the, the guy that had the demons in him, and he sent the demons to Legion, the pigs. He said, Legion, Legion. Wait a minute, yeah. That won't have um, church. No, nah, that wasn't at the church. No, no. But Jesus uh, went to the church. I'm not saying he didn't go, but look, right. but look at how Jesus separated discipleship from evangelism. Yeah. It ain't that he didn't do both. He was wise enough to separate them. So there were times where evangelism he even took the disciples. He said, listen, there were times where he looked at the disciples where they were around people evangelizing. And he said, y'all, come on, let's leave the crowd and get over here by ourselves. What he literally was saying, we're going to turn off evangelism and I am going to turn on discipleship, which means I am going to pour into you. Into you. The yeah. average church leader knows how to preach, but don't know how to pour. If there is no pouring, there is no discipleship. And if That's there good. is no access, there is no pouring. You can't pour into anything that don't have access to you. You don't have access to it. This is why we need to change our whole mindset on what discipleship is. And it's like nails on the chalkboard to me when I hear people say, well, the reason you need to come to church is so you can get disciples so we can have fellowship. That will be all well and good if the atmosphere was compatible with pouring. But it's only compatible with preaching getting information out but not allowing it to be unfold so that proper understanding could help bring growth and maturity but guess what that's not an evangelistic message because i'm trying to get you saved growth and maturity is not in an evangelistic message and it's not supposed to be this is why if you try to do it's both good. of them at the same time we're doing either one or the other or neither and we need to be effective by separating the two uh, since the devil says with the title of pastor in most denominations, there's almost a celebrity treatment that fits with that. That's attracting a lot of misplaced folks. And yeah, that's been going on. Hey, sometimes the the um, the preacher or the pastor is more popular than Jesus himself. That's why people go to church because because of that pastor. Pouring requires servanthood. Ooh, uh, nah. hey, that's what Jesus did. Yeah. Hey, washing the feet. Washing the feet. Yeah. That was not an evangelistic moment. That was a discipleship moment because what he was doing was, and that's one of the things that we got to change our mindset on Christianity because we quick to point the finger. Everybody points the finger at the church about, oh, it's full of Christians who are underdeveloped. 
what are we doing? With, yeah, but we don't question the system that they're getting developed in because the system is leaving them underdeveloped. Because if we pass it the way that Jesus poured the way that Jesus poured, they won't just hear our information, they would also see our example. And here's 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 how you can sum up Jesus interaction with the disciples real quick before we go on. It is this. Jesus says, come and be with me. Then he says, come and hear me and watch me do. He says, then we're going to do together. Then I'm going to sit back and watch you do. Remember when they couldn't, he sit back and watch them try to get catch the demon out and they couldn't and they came back. to Right. Him. And then after that, he says, now I'm going to feel more confident that I can send you off to do without me. Problem is Christianity. People can't be good Christians without their pastor being somewhere near. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what comes on to now let me go back to what chris white said in the beginning because he mentioned this well we can't go on sending people out because they're going to get real loose and do a lot of silly things and guess what that is 100 percent true if we consider the church as presently constructed why because when we sending people out we're not sending spiritual adults out we're spiritual people right. we're sending people out who are underdeveloped and get this underdeveloped also lends itself towards this which is different than evangelism. Giving people an opportunity, uh-oh, y'all not gonna like this, <laughs> to work and practice on their spiritual gifts and talents, not when they're by themselves, but when they are together. That's what 1 Corinthians 14 is about that the other person brought up earlier in the church. So with what Chris White said earlier, yeah, but here's the thing. If we trained adults and send them out, we, would, we wouldn't worry about they being loose because guess what? It's the same thing with real life. We are all adults, right? Mm -hmm. We don't say stop stop growing up children because if we send all these many adults out to be independent, we're going to worry about the adults no longer acting like adults. We don't do that, right? Because mm -hmm. natural life says, hey, if you're a grown man, I'm expecting you to be a grown man. Right. And do grown man stuff. And if not, we got a jail for that. We got court for that. <laughs> we got other things to hold you accountable until you grow up or to punish you for being an immature adult. An adult. But we don't generally think, worry about too many adults acting like children from a physical, not a psychological standpoint, but from a physical standpoint. Okay, if you're an adult, I'm not, I don't have to beg you, go pay your bills, go to work, you do that. Because now that you, you're grown, you become of age, you understand that I have different levels of responsibility. Spiritually, it should be the same way. If we took the time to say, you know what, I'm going to focus on pumping out into the world people who are adults spiritually. Hey, again, if you got questions or comments, all right, no matter where you're watching us from, feel free to interject, all right? This is an interactive yeah. show and, here. Yeah, and I understand that. I, I was saying from a standpoint of the 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 churches who may be doing it 100% wrong, trying to abruptly switch, like like how, how would they, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm saying is I, I wouldn't expect them to be able to just turn the switch like that. Like they, they really got to be some training um right to uh to take place amen and you know what part of that training is doing what jesus did jesus called disciples but he sent apostles and and so but now we can't skip that process meantime in between time because the reason why he was able to send apostles is because he spent time developing the disciples and to go along with your point this is what we need to do, because when I would get to it with a Christian leader or someone and they asked me, you know, Andrew, and I just actually had one about two weeks ago. He asked me, he said, Andrew, how can we take how can I start implementing what you do? And guess what? I know society has trained us to want everything microwave. But what I'm talking about is a long process. So the first thing I would tell leaders to do, first of all, change your mindset and just start. Don't just off the cuff start sending people out. No, turn around and start focusing on your pouring process. And then while you're doing that, delegating other authority that you don't just be the own man because it's going to drive any one person crazy if they try to really be a pastor to 100 people. So what yeah. needs to be happening is we need to have a plethora of leadership who is not micromanaged by the pastor, but they have been proven that they're an adults and they can do what is done, what, what Paul told Timothy to do. The same thing that you have witnessed of me. Commit now to faithful men, to faithful who? Not faithful yeah. children, to faithful men mm -hmm who would go and do the same thing that you've seen me do to you. So to and your point is that uh, in order for them to pour into them, they they need to have access. They need to be present. Oh, 
instead of going preaching in other other you know flying into just in other areas they need to be present at home <laughs> you <laughs> said it i didn't you y'all be made it wrong though i agree with him but he said it crawley ain't said that to <laughs> hey yeah well. and, and i think um from everything that um that crawley and everyone is saying uh it goes back to um i mean i'll use myself in this example i i have a I have a mentor um, that's been, you know, a mentor for me since I was 13 years old. He sent me some scriptures today. You saying before the internet, he would write me letters and and stuff like that, you know, encouraging me and stuff. <clears throat> and for me, it, it it became second nature to pour into people because I had somebody pour into me, you know. That's good. And, and I yeah. think. And I think for a lot of people, <clears throat> they go to church and I've seen people, I've seen a lot of whole different type scenarios in church. I've seen people sit in church um, for 40 and 50 years and they still spiritual babies because they were, mm -hmm. they were never, they were never poured into. And all of those people who they just get older in church, but they don't grow in church. Come on. They, now. they don't have anything to pour into others. Because nobody took the time to pour into them, uh, and and so um, so it, it 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 goes back to I think us getting back to the Bible, getting back to the original blueprint of how how it should be done, and that's why it's so important. Like even though um, it may seem uh, like a big transition for those who are not doing it, once you come into a knowledge of the truth, you don't have any choice but to implement it. You know, it it, it would seem. If you really love the people and if you really and that's why one of the things that pastors need to be reminded of is have you left your first love? Because your first love was never to grow a ministry. It was always to bless the people to and see them to maturity. Hmm. So and, but here's the thing. But when you see them to maturity, and here's the thing that's again, another I'm about to say something that we, we're not going to be used to. But when you look at the way Jesus pastored. When Jesus called the disciples, he didn't call lifelong members. Mm. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've yeah. said this before. Y'all have heard me say this before. Yeah. One of the worst things that a church could have is a graveyard in the back of it. Because it signals to us, I find a church and I go there until I die. So when you leave a church, oh, there's going to be a problem with the pastor. We don't even see leaving a church as a beautiful thing. Jesus did. This is why Jesus, unlike the average pastor, not because they mean well or not, not because they evil or not, it's because they've been duped by the traditions of men that what does the Paul say has made the word of God of none effect. How ineffective has our have our traditional practice rendered the word? So mm -hmm. look at it. Jesus looked forward to graduating his disciples. What does that mean? He wasn't just excited about calling new members, he was just as excited as for releasing those members. Once they become of age, because you know what? The only thing that can prove if you are a successful leader is what happens to your pupils when they separate from your life. Wow, that's powerful right there. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Hey, again, this, this is a deep critical dialogue right here, y'all. I mean, and it's definitely opening my eyes to some to certain things. And yeah, if you got a question or comment, feel free, you know, hey, um, interject no matter where you where you are watching from. OK, sometimes death in churches comes before physically. Hey, yeah. I mean, again, the system of the way that we're doing church and this is always this has been a part of Crawley's ministry. All right. Again, looking at the way how we do church, you know, and, and again, you know, we need to do it the right way. Uh, like like Dr. Wheatley says, in our culture, most Christians are church attendees and not disciples because leaders themselves have not been discipled because a lot went out, but were not sent. Yeah. And a lot <laughs> um, of them are winging it. But, you know, what? we're not paying attention. And a lot of times that doesn't get a lot of TV time. But there are some pastors and leaders crying mm -hmm. out be like, man, I've gotten ministry wrong. And they're looking for how to change it, how to be more pure. Some of them have come to themselves. It's not a lot. It's not all of them. But there are some that you really don't hear about. But the thing about it is organic way is the best way. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's just yeah. do it. Let's just become the new church of old, like I, like I put the slogan for my, for my organization. And that is, we're not trying to come up with anything new. Let's just stick with what worked back then. 
Right. And what worked right. back then was taping the time to pour into disciples because the more that you train disciples, right. guess what? That makes your job easier. What happens is the more babies you invite to the church, the more babies now the pastor got to try to juggle. And that's what's one of the things that's driving them crazy is he got a church full of babies and nobody else developed enough to help them pastor and raise those babies. So why is it that if you parents out there, why is it that if someone tell you, we love children, we love our babies, right? Why mm -hmm. is it that if someone come to you tomorrow and be like, man, I'm going to drop three newborn babies off at your house or three children to your house to live with you for forever <laughs> and you're going to yeah. be responsible for raising them. Why aren't you going to be excited about that even though you love babies? You want to know why? And here's the problem that the church should have. Because the reason why you don't want any other kids extra in your house is because you haven't made a place and a table that's going to be accommodating ah. for those babies to be raised. Ah. So get this. I don't want any I don't want any child in my house that I can't accommodate. And what the church uh, is doing, the <laughs> church is trying to fill up the church full of kids that they are not ready to help grow up. Even right. though they still could be considered new paying clients. <laughs> man, you preaching, bro. <laughs> oh man. Hey, sound what like, are y'all thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> sound like they trying to get some spiritual social security. <laughs> ah. <laughs> hey. Hey. They try to get they try to get some checks. They ain't worried about hey, it. They eat or not. Hey, <laughs> that Jesus hustle, man. Social security. Yeah. It is oh, a, you're right. It is, it is a numbers game. And, it and, is a numbers and you game. know. And the thing about it is, God is going to mm -hmm. pastors, preachers, bishops, denominational heads. Please, let's be reminded of this. Think on these things when you are by yourself and you're doing and taking an assessment of your motivation behind how you operate in church. When And we do know leaders will be held at a higher, at a different standard when it comes to judgment. We know that that's biblical. But we need to be reminded, God is not going to judge a pastor based on how he grew that church physically. He's going to judge a pastor on his ability to take someone from immaturity to maturity. So even if your church went from 3,000 down to 30, but if you took those 30 from spiritual babies to now on the battlefield for the Lord in spiritual maturity, that's more success in God's eyes concerning a pastor. Because, see, mm -hmm. our problem is we don't know the difference between a pastor and evangelist, a bishop. So we treat them all as preachers behind a pulpit. Mm -hmm. Let the evangelist be the one that replenishes the church, not the pastor. But when the pastor is trying to replenish, he stops being focused on trying to develop because he's too busy trying to replenish. This is why we shouldn't try to be everything, a one-stop shop. And everybody who's a preacher and a leader think you can do everything. There are five things in Ephesians 4 for a reason. And, and our problem is the reason why there's so much burnout in the church is because one man is trying to do the job of five others. He got to be the angel of the house, the evangelist, yeah. the bishop, the pastor, and the apostle. And guess what? Because they're all nice titles, he's trying to take all of them. And if you give them two more, he'll snap them to his name by next month. <laughs> but what needs to happen is one of the beauties about discipline, especially in Christian leadership, is that when God show you who you are, you understand. And he also you also allow him to show you who you are not. And so what happens is any true fivefold leader, you honor mm -hmm. other leaders that bring to the table what you don't. You don't compete with them. That's what stops competition, the humility of knowing I'm not a one stop shop and I'm limited and I can only mm -hmm. offer you pastoral care. The evangelist right. can offer you an, invita an, an, an invitation. The apostle can offer you the foundational for, for how churches ran in ecclesiology. But if I try to do all that and be an overseer, it's going to drive me crazy. What, what I've always believed for, with evangelism, and again, I, this is what I feel God has called me that area for, is, especially through entertainment. All right. I believe that, you know, all these gospel artists, no matter what style you do, I believe it's more so for evangelistic purposes to directing folks to or, or, or as you say that invitation to get saved but again when it comes to discipleship i believe also too again you know we are called to be the be that that spiritual para, paramedic you know to be ready that's why we have to be discipled when we go out into evangelism and especially when you see it in the entertainment industry in in, in, in gospel industry there's not a lot of disciple entertainers out there so all right yeah, 
You know, but do we have to ask the question this too? Going back to is church invitations the Great Commission? Have we ever asked ourselves is it is the does the Bible or the lack thereof that's in the Bible should that send an indication to us that we're overly relying on something that is constructed called the altar call? Hmm. When you look at an yeah. altar call, yeah. can you find one instance of scripture where there's an altar call in the church? In the temple? No. No. Why is it that we go from so much of a big absence in the scripture, but we, but that's all we hinging on to get folks saved? There should be, there sh that should at least give us a cause to be like, maybe God in the scriptures designed it another way that we're not embracing. And maybe if we at least try it that way, we might see another level of effectiveness. Because again, I'm not saying the people who do all the calls are we going to eat. I'm talking about the people who have a good heart. They really want to see people saved. I'm just saying what, what happens is let the altar be the people who are trained and discipled and mature enough to go out and reach people. This is why I say church shouldn't be for everybody. This is why Jesus wasn't didn't operate like a hospital when he says, I come from the sick, not the well. He acted like a mobile physician. He went to where they mm -hmm. were. Jesus, not once that's recording the scripture, invited somebody to come to the temple to hear him preach, even though he preached in the temple. It seems like to me that Jesus, right, didn't well. look at, Jesus didn't hinge him preaching in the temple. He didn't hang his evangelism hat on that. But we do. And I'm just saying it's mm. called for us to be like, hmm, when I look at the stories that we all preach and we preach them down, look how he extended grace to this lady. She was caught in this one, but where the dude that was doing it with her? And he said, go and sin no more. He looked at another lady and said, you've had five husbands and the one you with now ain't even yours. Look at mm. all of those beautiful stories of evangelism mm -hmm. that were done away from the temple. Then look at the Bible, Old and New Testament. I don't see a whole lot of altar calls going on. Mm -hmm. What that seems to be that there's a disconnect somewhere that we're missing. And so because they, of it, guess what it guess what it brings? The poison of the more you invite sinners in, the more you're going to be accommodating to them. So now that's why we have all type of heresies and doctrines going on because we so, feel church should be made for the sinner. So real quick, so you say, so an altar call should basically be on the evangelistic aspect of it while you're out in the field talking with that sinner or so, you know, after you presented Christ instead of in the ecclesiastical of, of the church. Or Let's stop whatever. being lazy. Let's stop being lazy and says, I can only reach, I can only work on sinners if you bring them to where I am. Why don't you go ye therefore to where they are? And, and again, so here's the thing about the altar, because. Let's stop. Let's stop saying that. Oh, the church ain't the building. We are the church, but we still acting like the church is the building. Because if we really do believe that church, that we construct the spiritual <laughs> benefit, yeah. we who are saving are together, then guess what's going to happen? Then we know that the love for the unsaved person, they are experiencing the love of Christ just as much if they're in the midst hey, of yeah. a of a seasoned Christian who can get them to Jesus as if they were in a church service. And that's our yes, problem. well. That's yeah, a work. perfect, yeah, perfect example. Philip in the Ethiopian unit, a good, a good, good evangelism <clears throat> example. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Will, for yeah. bringing that up. Hey, uh, yeah. Uh, Go and, ahead, Chris. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say uh, when when Carly was talking, he, he he made me think about the whole uh, swag surf thing at William Murphy's church because <laughs> because he later did an interview, and yeah, we ain't just trying it. to bash these guys, but he did an interview yeah, right, and he was right. basically like, uh, they just mad. Because we had so and so many people come to the altar and and, mm -hmm. and get saved and they think that they've been effective uh when they when they're when they're really out of order, you know what I'm saying? And 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 um the, the phrase that uh that uh Crawley used earlier when you say you had the, the evangelistic church is killing the discipleship church. church. Yeah, and, yeah, and I'm just saying is uh and I ain't trying to beat up on these guys, but that's that's really just a prime example. Of, of how off that that we could be because what yeah. they're looking at is something as a as, as success or a win like like how are you gonna tell me God is trying to do something different we had 150 people come to the altar and and, and so so we could play swag surf and and any other song we want to play as long as that happens you know 
So um, mm -hmm. anyway, it's just, just no. But um, you know what? The, the reason why I like how you brought it up is, can we all just notice uh, what's going on? Gener generally speaking, look at how thinking the church should be for sinners is affecting some big names. Like not only William, the reason why William Murphy even did it and defended it is because he felt church should be a place where we could reach sinners. Not only that, just just go back a little ways, what, months or quarter before that when we dealt with the Jamal Bryant. He talking about making the church a weed hub. <laughs> Why? Because, and then, and everybody clapping because he's like, man, if I could get the weed smoker to, and, and if all I can do is just get them in church, see how bringing the world to church affects us in foolishness? Not only yeah. that, let me bring you up today and we probably, let's, we okay we, if we don't come up with anything next week we can table this next week because I didn't play you the video about what everybody's been talking about what happened recently with Easter and 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 the Stephen Furtick lady. You know, I don't know if y'all have heard, but uh, there was an interview with the lady who's over Stephen Furtick's um, communication, whatever you call it. And I was actually going to pull that clip up because well, it's a lot of controversy it, yes. because she oh. said she was like, well, when we invite people to Easter, um, we're not going to use the words like the blood of Jesus. We're not going to say resurrection because that makes people feel like they're outsiders. Do you see how, but what they but she even said, we want to try to make coming to church as easy as possible for the one who is not saved. Look at how, when we, when the goal is to pull the church up with sinners and unsaved, I got pastors right now that I know personally, they're baffled because they, they're caught in between. Should we make them believe before they belong? Or can they belong before they believe? All of this is is, is is so confusing because we don't even understand what mm. church is for. Church is not for the unsaved. Church is to develop the believer to go out and minister to the unsaved. But it is not for the unsaved. But when we try to make it for the unsaved, we get all these hashtags. We get the Stephen Furtick. And let me let me also, because we got to be, we, we got to do it right. And we got to treat people like we want to be treated. First of all, where everybody seems to be an uproar about that one clip, I went and saw the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And what people are up is about the Stephen Furtick, they, first of all, the lady <laughs> made it clear. If you look at the whole thing, he looked, she made it clear and say, listen, I'm saying that when we're trying to reach people outside of the church to bring them in, we're not going to use that language. Right, she said, but Stephen can and has used it inside the church. So a lot of people are outraged is they hadn't seen, seen the whole clip because she never said that they wasn't going to use that language in church. She said they was not going to use that language and in inviting people to church. And a lot of people don't understand. Stephen Furtick never said that they wasn't going to that they was putting those terms and bears to rest. So we got to also have integrity when we report and when we mm -hmm. lash out and we can't hold people to 30 second clips. Because when you see the whole thing, she didn't say like what a whole lot of people are making her say in defense to that. Amen. Amen. Wow. Uh, yeah. Hey, man, this this definitely makes you think, y'all. I mean, and again, if, if we're going to do this, you know, we definitely need to do it right. And it's going to take some time because once you do something long for so I mean, wrong for so long, it's it it really becomes your truth. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> again, a, a, a rehearsed lie can be, become your truth. All right. And that's just pretty much how it is. It's been going on for hundreds of years, how the way we do church. And, and and especially with evangelism and discipleship, we don't get enough teaching on what what does true discipleship look like, and 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 then for us, and even what what does true evangelism look like. But Will Will brought up a perfect scripture, a perfect story there. Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. All right, yeah. again, that's what evangelism is is supposed to be right there, and 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 the, and the eunuch gave his life to Christ from reading the book of Isaiah or so. And Philip explained to explain it to him. That's what evangelism is. Yeah. And the and Man. the product foundation, <clears throat> what we have to begin yeah. is we have to be willing to re-examine what we think church is. Because like I said, there's a reason why we think church should have lifelong members until they die. And the moment someone leaves a church, we say something's wrong with that. But here's the thing: when I left my mama's yeah. house, we didn't see that there's something wrong. My mama celebrated the fact that, hey, I done raised a grown man that now you going on your own, so I ain't got to feed you no more. But what, what happens is in the church, we still try to pastor people who are 45 year old in the spirit. <laughs> and what ends up happening is like the old country man used to say, hey, it ain't enough room in one house for two grown men because they're yep. going to bump heads. And what is happening in church, your what is happening, pastors and Christians in the church system it helped people mature to a certain degree, but then it recycled right, their, ma yeah. their maturity back into immaturity because guess what? In order to remain comfortable 
interacting with your pastor, you got to always be looked at as the little kid that need him to minister to you. Right. So we go to church to get fed. Think about I'm looking for a church to feed me. If you've been a, if you've been a spiritual adult and you've been saved for 20 years, you need to learn how to feed yourself. And you don't go to church just like you don't go to your parents now that are you 30 and 40 like you did when you were three years old. They had to know everything. They had to know where you were. Right. They fed yeah. you. They dictated what clothes you wore. And that's what pastors are doing. They are still doing this to people who are adults. And now it's causing not only a disconnect, but nobody understand the reason why. Sometimes it ain't the pastor's fault. It ain't the people's fault. It's the system's fault. But we never look at the system but because it, it has normalized putting people at odds with one another because it's unnatural. It's even unspiritually right. natural. Hey, man, we almost about out of time. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to piggyback off what he said. Uh, now, knowing my background, I'm 25 years in the military. And I was also a recruiter. And, and one thing, like with the yeah. process, that's why some things in church just frustrate me because for, I, I can see from a military standpoint, it don't make sense. Um, mm -hmm. Basic mm -hmm. training for the Army is two months. For for the Air Force, it's like a month and a half. For the Marine Corps, it's, it's three months. After a month and a half, two months or three months of training, you could, you know what I'm saying? You, you're ready to kill something, you know? Um, mm. Then you go get a little specialized training. And then there, there are times when you, you get additional trainings along the way through your career to progress and so on and so forth. But nobody stays in basic training for 40 years. That's you know what I'm saying? That's good, Chris. No, nobody, uh, um, you know what I'm saying? Even those that, that go on and, and be high in rank, you go and you get specialized training and stuff, but it it's not a lot of time. It's more application. It's more get out there and do something. And when you get to that point, you know, even if you have to go to war, you're not going to war by yourself. You're going to war with people who already have some experience. Mm -hmm. And 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 so uh, so so yeah. So Very so good. it's just like I said. Is I see all of that stuff from a spiritual standpoint. And when I look at the Bible, and, and most of the times things that we see in the Bible, if it may. If if it made biblical sense, it, it usually make natural sense if you think about it, and and, mm -hmm. and uh, you like all truth is parallel, so to speak, and um, so so yeah. So anyway, just just piggybacking off of what he said, and and just another thing that we can look at, like we don't we don't stay in college forever, we don't you know since stay in our mama house forever. So why yeah, should we yeah. stay? Why should we stay in this situation forever? Well said, well said, man. Uh, uh, and from a historical aspect, um, Sydney says, even though we had the Reformation, it did not change what was expected of the pastor in the congregants. Ooh, and, uh, I like that's a hey, yeah, that's loaded. Protestant Reformation. Yeah, <laughs> that's loaded. But I, that's loaded. And that's true. Thank you so much for submitting that, yeah. sir. Man, we might need yeah. to do a part two on this or so. Uh, yeah, we might have to do a part two. I ain't even get to first, I ain't even get to the scriptures, first Corinthians, and oh, all man. that. So, yeah, we probably have to do a part two next week. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, because yeah. yeah, I know you all have some questions out there, you know, and you're and you're thinking, you know, again, that cognitive dissonance, you know, because you're you're relating to what to what you were taught, and again, I get it, you know what I'm saying? You know, those that 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 um taught us, we hold them in high esteem, but again. You know, it's all about growing and, and what does the word of God say? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We say yes, a part two. Okay, yeah. Hey, if nothing else comes up, then yeah, we're gonna do a part two and all. I mean, and and I thank yeah. God, hey, man, you know, man, 42 of you all have, have watched us the you know this night here live and all. And and again, you go back and watch the replay. All right. Yes, Luke 14 and 23 gives direction, common sense, and Hey, Common Sense been bringing some stuff, man, hey, hey, along yeah. with everyone else, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like I much. said, we haven't even got to Corinthians because there's some things that we could point out in Scripture that's overlooked. So we'll do mm -hmm. that on the part two, Lord willing, if that'll be next week. But, yeah, and all I want to leave you guys with, and if we have any leaders watching, just, just ask yourself, am I doing it the way I see Jesus did it? And Thank if you, not, how can I change that? Because, again, he was so excited about graduating his disciples. And like I said this, Though pastoral care should be a just like my parents, pastoral care is a lifelong respect, but it is not a lifelong engagement. That's good. But in That's church, good. we treat it as a lifelong engagement. And just like he says, we celebrate people. Oh, I've been a part of this church. Who is the only people who celebrate longevity in a school? It's not the student. It's only those who are facilitating. Yeah. See, facilitators retire. Students graduate. My no. God. <laughs> I don't preach right now. I don't preach. That so, will so, preach. So, 
<laughs> when have you ever heard a student celebrate the fact that I've been around school for 20, 30 years? Well, we're going to look at you and be like, you, you didn't get it. With you. <laughs> and the teachers didn't teach it. <laughs> See, students look forward to graduation. That's Faculty awesome. look forward to, they celebrate longevity. They've been laid back, man, I've been a faithful worker here yeah. for 40 and 50 years. Yeah, that's because you've been called to help facilitate. You didn't come yeah. to school to learn. You came to school to help school be school. Help school. There you go. That's why I'm a teacher. Hey, man. Part yeah. two. Part two. Part two next week. Hey, hey. We, hey, we would love to have some pastors come on as well, too. All right. Hey, again, you know, we're not here to bash no pastors, nothing like that. All right. Again, we, you know, we, we, we want your perspective on this. As well, when because again, it's all about learning and growing. What does the word say? We all have our own opinions, but what does the word say? <laughs> all right, and we got to match our opinions, our beliefs with what the word says. Yeah, that's that's the bottom line, man. Hey, but thank you all so much again for being a part of us, Chris. Man, hey, uh, any last words you want to say, man? Hey, man, hey, thank man you so much. I, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be a part of the show, man. I appreciate y'all. Hey, man, we thank you, man. man it was a delight, man, when I see you came up on the screen tonight, man. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. Thank you for the portion that you bring. And yes. uh, it just, I mean, it's really, this is what Ron and I are after, and that's why we wanted more people to kind of even heed your example because it makes it more, you know, like that. It brings a different angle. It brings a great question. It brings, you know what I'm saying? Man. So, I'm, I'm, man, you, I can't put words to how I really appreciate you what you have been doing, man. And and so Likewise. thank you so much for that, bro. Thanks. Cause I know your time is that is very valuable. And uh, I just really appreciate yeah. that. Really put a hey. smile on you. Thank you. Hey, Definitely. hey man, y'all, y'all, y'all brothers are blessing to me, man. Uh, and the people Praise in the God. comments, uh, you know what I'm yeah. saying? It's, it's a, uh, it's Praise a family God. affair. I appreciate yes, everybody. Is. Praise God. Again, any, any of you pastors that are watching or some of you future pastors or some of y'all looking to take another pastor's spot or whatever. Yeah. So, hey, again, we, we, we want you a part of this conversation. All right. Don't be scared. Or not. Hey, nobody's here to to um, condemn, you know, hey, it's, it's all about learning. All right. Again, why are you pastoring? We, we need to learn the difference between discipleship and evangelism. And, I, and, that, and that was very powerful. That, that, that really stuck stuck with me. And, I, and I'm definitely going to do some more research on that and realize, because, no, I'm, I'm not trying to be no pastor. You know? But, again, we are called to make disciples. So um, I ask the Lord to increase my learning and, 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 and to stir up those gifts so that when I do do these, music, these musical events and things like that, that's more so evangelizing, it, giving that invitation. But I'll be ready to say, hey, look, do you know Christ is your Lord and personal Savior? All right. Or if or or be ready to answer with whatever question. All right. Yes, this is a safe place where people can ask questions as well. All right. This is a safe, safe spot for you. So nobody here is going to condemn you. Again, we're having a dialogue, dialogue without the disrespect. OK, regardless if we do not see eye to eye. On it, all right. <laughs> OK, uh, we have pastors, but where are the teachers? And uh, yeah, hey. And you know we yeah, have there. some pastors that we have some pastors that's been watching for quite some time, and we we honor you yes. guys on the sideline, man. And you know, just like you know, definitely we have you all to come up here and 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 bring an angle to the conversation of of experience. You know what I'm saying? Because if you haven't been a Christian leader, you don't know what it's like being a Christian leader. I told right. my folks that a couple of weeks ago. I said, listen, I know y'all. If you ain't never been in Christian leadership, please understand you don't know what it's like. So you also have to consider someone else's vantage point, especially right. if you don't understand it or you or because of lack of experience in it. You know what I'm saying? But those of us who have been led, who lead people, mm. we understand. And, you know, so it's easy to point the finger at something that you're not, but you give more grace to something that you are trying to either understand and you give more of a pillar to, you know, the grace and the mercy that we all should have towards one another because none of us is going to get it all right. So we do want pastors to understand that, bro, we encourage those who still have a pure heart while in an unpure system, not nah. even realizing that it's the system. You know, we're not pointing the finger at you. We're just trying to help you look back and re-examine the thing that you probably never would even have a chance or even ever been told to look at. That's it. So, well, thank oh, you. Oh, so and, and real quick, yeah, Sydney, we uh, we have one day. I think we'll probably do a show on that pastor pastoral Ooh, success. That is a plan. good one. Ain't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've heard. I, um, I forgot it. I forgot his name, but I remember this one preacher that that spoke on that. And uh, and it's just like, yeah, you know, we we have that all wrong. And uh, you mean you mean to tell me if I, um, I'm, I'm not gonna get my double portion for cutting the pasture grass? 
<laughs> or clean it, or um, cleaning the toilets and everything, and all that. You, you, you might clean up the church. Hey. hey, hey, you might. You just can't guarantee hey. it. You know that's our problem. This is like you get a blessing for blessing the man of God, but when they try yeah. to tunnel vision, everybody that cut the grass is going to get a fivefold blessing, or, sir. Or Come everybody on, sir. that, or everybody that cleans the church. So you know what I'm saying? Hey, you know, yeah, you're being a servant. So yeah, <laughs> servanthood. Okay, <laughs> he's under thought. All right, y'all. Hey, y'all, you have a blessed one out there. Be safe. We'll see you for another dialogue. And if you got any, make sure you go and join our YouTube page. All right, subscribe to our YouTube page. We, we would greatly appreciate it. And if you want to bless us, all right, financially, feel free. All right, there's the cash app right there. Okay, if you want to sow whatever it is, hey, thank you. All right, and, and help help push critical dog critical dialogue out there. All right. Well, hey, we're good. God bless y'all. We'll see you again for another dialogue. Remember, you matter. All right. So, yeah, just do what.